All right, so we've been talking about quite a few topics now, and now we're going to really come to one of the most important ones in church planting, and that is evangelism and discipleship. If you are doing pioneer church planting, especially in pioneer church planting, but even if you're planting a daughter church, uh, you want to be reaching new people for Christ. That's one of the main points. You're not going to just plan a new church to rearrange Christians from one church into another church. You want to be expanding the kingdom. You want to be reaching new people for Jesus. You want to be uh, that new kingdom community that's going to be impacting the environment as salt and light. And so we need to talk about evangelism and discipleship. The two go hand in hand. By evangelism, we're talking about the initial communication of the gospel that encourages people to make a faith decision to become followers of Christ. And discipleship, we're talking about more that process of learning to walk with Christ, of learning to obey all that Christ taught us, of learning to be a Christ-like person who's experiencing the power of the Spirit, changing their lives, and all that's involved with that. And so we're talking, we need to look at this as an entire process. And I'm sure you probably have other courses on evangelism in particular, and uh, we won't try and say all that could be said about evangelism. We're going to focus in primarily on that aspect of evangelism, how it interrelates with church planting in particular. And um, sometimes the church can sort of become isolated, like this cartoon sort of shows, that Christians sort of end up living in their island, their own little subculture, their world, and it seems like the world they're trying to reach is, is off on another island, and uh, the waters between those two islands are shark invested. How can the church build a bridge to the people outside the church? And especially in many parts of the world, the general culture may be of a totally different religion. They may have totally different values. They may not have any understanding of what Christianity is really about. And they look at Christians and they say, those Christians are just sort of strange people that live in a whole nother world. I can't relate to that world at all. Christians have different values. They, they have different words they use in church when they talk. They, they uh, relate to one another differently. Uh, how can we build that bridge to a world that seems in many ways so very different than the world of the Christians? And um, sometimes we view evangelism as sort of a foray. It's been described as sort of like the church is this fortress and we keep Christians safe. The world is sort of a dangerous place out there, right? And, and so the church is this safe fortress. But then every now and then we lower down the drawbridge and we let the Christians go out for an evangelistic uh, blitzkrieg out into that dangerous world. And hopefully, hopefully we will find a few people out there who are willing to uh, embrace the message and they will come into the safe fort with us out of, the, out of that terrible, dangerous world and then up goes the drawbridge again and we're safe. Well, I don't know about you or your church, but uh, there's a lot of Christians that sort of think that way. That, um, and that's kind of what evangelism is. It's sort of these, these forays into the world and hopefully we'll find somebody who's willing to withdraw again. Uh, when Jesus said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, as one person put it, the salt has to get out of the salt shaker to really be salty. And Jesus said, don't put a basket over the light. You've got to let the light shine. In fact, it said that men will see your good works and they will praise God. And so that means that Christians need to on the one hand, they need to be salty. They need to be light. They do need to be different than the general culture, but different in the right way. Not just different that, you know, we dress differently or we talk a little differently or um, all the things we don't do that other people do, but the saltiness, the savor of Jesus Christ. That that Christ-likeness is what makes us different. But the salt has to get out of the salt shaker. The light has to get out from under the basket. We need to have relationships with those who we are trying to reach for Christ 
to show them not only the truth of the gospel, but the beauty of the gospel. As one person put it, uh, you don't want to listen to the words of a song if you don't like the melody of the song. And the Christian life, as, as the non-Christian observes the way the Christian lives, the way he relates to people, the way she is kind, forgiving, that should sort of be the music of the gospel. And then that creates the interest to want to hear the message, the words, the lyrics of the gospel. And so we need to find ways that we're relating to people in the world that we're trying to reach. So there are a number of dangers. One that we sort of view people as objects of evangelism, uh, as if they weren't real human beings with it, that deserve to be loved and cared for and respected. They're not objects of evangelism. We don't sort of put a notch in, in our, our, our pistol that we got one more convert. It's not about just growing the church so we've got a big church and we've got a fancy ministry and we can pay our bills. It's really about loving people, relating to people the way Christ related to people. And he related to people very differently. The woman caught in adultery, he related to her one way. He related to the young rich ruler in a very different way. And so as we come to know people and care about people, we relate to them a little differently and the way we even share the gospel will be a little different depending on the person their needs, where they're at in their life, what their concerns are. One other potential danger with the way we look at evangelism sometimes is that we consider evangelism always focused sort of at the point of conversion. In other words, did that person repent and in faith receive Jesus Christ as their savior? Then we say, well, then that was successful. That person crossed the line, they became born again, they became a Christian. Well, of course, that's important. Jesus said you can't enter the kingdom if you're not born again. I believe that there is a, a punctual conversion point in the life of a person that, where they pass from darkness to light, from death to life. This is the language of the Bible. No question about that. But for most people, that is a longer process to get there. In fact, it's usually somewhat unusual for a person upon the very first hearing of the gospel to just make a decision, a life-changing decision just like that. Most people, it's a process. And uh, there was what developed what was one time sort of called the, the Engel scale of, of how people might be very far from faith. In fact, they might even be hostile towards Christians. I don't like Christians. Christians are, are hypocrites or Christians are against our culture, our religion, our people, whatever. Very negative. You might call this a minus five. They're, they're just very negative about Christians. But then they begin to move and they say, well, maybe Christians aren't such bad people after all. They met some Christians that were kind and, and were different in a positive way. And so they start becoming a little more friendly towards the gospel, and then they say, well, what is the message? What do Christians really believe? Ah, now the person has moved to a point, maybe we'll call this a minus two, where they're sort of a seeker, and they're going, well, what is it, what makes you different? Or, or what do Christians really believe? Or what is it with Jesus? And then there comes that point where the person says, wow, maybe Jesus is for me. Maybe this message really is true. Maybe I need to make a commitment to Jesus Christ. I need forgiveness of sin. He can change my life. So you're right before, and so they usually call this sort of the point zero is where the person makes that decision for Christ. That's where they become converted. That's where they repent. That's where they receive Christ for forgiveness. They put their trust in him. They become born again. They become a new creature. We often forget that there were many steps leading up to this point, and sometimes we will hear somebody 
uh, who says, well, you know, I shared Christ with this person and they accept, they prayed and they received Christ and they became a Christian. We go, wow, now that person's really an evangelist. You know, maybe I've never had that happen to me where I've done that. We think that person's really doing it. But we forget that that same person probably had a long way to get to that point. And there may have been many other people, other Christians, who had been praying for that person, who'd been showing kindness to that person, who'd been answering questions, giving that person maybe a Bible to read or literature, that had led up to that point where they finally made the decision. Okay? And so this may be a very long way. It may be months. It may be even years. One study in Taiwan found out that those people who made decisions to become Christians and who carried on, you see, then you begin to grow in your faith with Christ. Those people who made decisions to follow Christ and carry through and became church members and became fruitful Christians in Taiwan, they had about a two-year period from here to here. In other words, it was a long time of them coming to understand what the faith was about and then to finally make a decision that was really going to be a life-changing one. And sometimes the quick decisions, sometimes, not always, but sometimes the quick decisions are not very thought through. You see, because as a person makes that decision for Christ right here, then they begin to grow or maybe they don't. They begin to have doubts. It's fairly normal for a person to say, wow, was that really the right thing to do? Is Christ really who he said he was? And they begin to have doubts. Perhaps their family hears about it. They get resistance. Other people say, what? You didn't become a Christian, did you? And they face perhaps opposition, spiritual opposition. Satan will tempt them, and so on and so forth. And so there comes a time of deliberation. Was this really true? And this is why I say evangelism must flow through to discipleship. So evangelism, we think, primarily is this part. And discipleship or follow-up is then this part. And uh, it's sort of like we could call this the pregnancy, if you will, and then this is the birth. But, of course, what mother would bring a baby into the world and then just say, well, it was born. Wasn't that wonderful? Um, let's go do that again. No, you nurture that baby, don't you? Because you know that baby's fragile. That baby can't survive on its own. That baby needs a lot of care. It can't feed itself and all these sort of things. And so you care for that baby. And, and for a person who is a brand new believer, they need that spiritual nurture immediately. This is one of the problems sometimes with large evangelistic campaigns. Uh, the evangelistic campaign is focused on this here. Now those people who maybe have been prepared and people have been praying, they come to that evangelistic campaign and uh, there may be some sort of a call for decision, altar call, or we think of Billy Graham campaigns. But the question is, how will the follow-up happen? Who will give that newborn baby the nurture and the care they need? And so one of the dangers is going to be, A, we focus so much on just this conversion point, we forget the process leading up to this, or we forget the follow-up process that goes after. We say, well, you became a Christian, you just come to church every Sunday and you'll be fine. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. Well, that person has so many questions. They got issues in their lives. They're trying to figure out how do I read the Bible? How does a person pray? And, you know, they're going to pick up some of that by just sort of attending church. But usually they're going to need a more intentional assistance in learning how to live as a Christian, how to trust Christ, how to read the Bible, how to pray, how to deal with temptation, how to deal with opposition from family or other people. They're going to need spiritual care that brings them into growth. And then ultimately, we want to see them become not just a Christian who follows through, but a Christian who becomes a servant, a Christian who becomes mature, a Christian who discovers their gifts and, and serves others and, and is salt and light in their community and shares their faith so they continue to grow in their walk with Christ. 
And so we need to see evangelism and discipleship as more of a process. And I'll show you later uh, just one way that we have done this in some of the churches that I've planted to make sure that we're seeing that as a whole process. And uh, that actually even the way our church was structured is to help people move through all these steps and not just be focused in on the one.